What constitutes a Tampen Shosetsu by Ishikawa Jun? Tampen Shosetsu no Kosei is Ishikawa's most often cited essay of literary criticism. It first appeared in March, for, no, March 1940 in issue 3 of Gendai Bunsho Koza and was later included in Bungak Taigai, his uh, major monograph of literary criticism published in 1942. As I argue in chapter 6 of this book, the essay, despite its title and opening vow, is an implicit theory of the Shosetsu. Often translated as novel, Shosetsu is better described as a piece of fictional narrative. Tampen Shosetsu, a modern neologism usually translated as short story, is used rather idiosyncratically by Ishikawa to denote most works of modern Japanese fiction, which he considers uh, pseudo Shosetsu. Ishikawa sees this umbrella category as consisting of two main types, which he calls Kant and the novel. Kant, the French word for short tales or stories, is used by Ishikawa to denote what are generally called tampen, such as those by Japan's most renowned conteur, Aktaga Ryunosuke. Novel, a prose genre that has its roots in the medieval Breton Le and Frablo, is used by Ishikawa to denote most so-called modern shosetsu, which he regards as false or botched shosetsu. Crucially, Ishikawa regards both Kant and Novella as antithetical to his notion of the true shos shosetsu, which lies outside the genealogy of literature, bungaku, and art, geijutsu, defies direct definition and theorization, and is extremely rare. Ishikawa's philosophy of shosetsu also draws from André Gide, whose modernist novels, or récits, as he, as Gide preferred to call them, uh, he, he translated before his official literary debut in 1935, for 36, I can't remember. Um, okay, that was my introductory blurb to this essay. This essay uh, in, my, in, in the book has lots of footnotes and annotations, so it's not going to make much sense but it should give you a general idea of what he's uh, uh, concerned with in the mid-1930s um, and 1940 when he wrote this essay. Alright, on to the... Part 1. What determines the length of a work? What is a shosetsu? No, wait. That is precisely the question I will try to avoid here. The topic I've been assigned is the so-called tampen shosetsu, and so it seems we can assume the debate over the Shosetsu's essence has already been resolved and a tacit understanding already reached between theorists and readers. I shall therefore forego a metaphysical inquiry into the essential nature of the Shosetsu and drum, jump straight into a simple consideration of length. After all, anyone who attempts to pin down the Shosetsu's true nature and locate its universal standard form is bound to fall into a never-ending spiral of explanations that ultimately lead Nowhere. Explanations that ultimately lead nowhere. And further, who needs to be told what a shosetsu is? Your average man on the street understands well enough that shosetsu exists, and that awareness, vague though it may be, somehow strikes me as much more elegant than any stuffy academic lecture, as it is untroubled by that crass question of essence, and rooted in the crude but solid foundation of common sense and sound judgment. Since my task here is simply to keep the discussion moving along smoothly, I would not dare to commit the indiscretion of deviating from this firm footing. And yet, at the same time, I cannot guarantee that, that I will not suddenly slip back into that boorish question about the Shosetsu's essential nature. Should such a slippage occur, please do not regard it as some rebellious plot on my part to create a disturbance by challenging majority opinion. See it instead as my humble attempt to prevent the discussion from derailing and to avoid the indiscretion of divulging my own personal inadequacies by prudently seeking this firm footing of common sense. At any rate, as I was saying, people know that Shosetsu exists. But what determines their length remains a mystery. Standard terms like tampen shosetsu, short shosetsu, and chohen shosetsu, long shosetsu, are useless and indeed reveal the inherent difficulty of establishing a precise or objective standard of measurement based on word or page count. Though we are tempted, we are tempted to say simply that shosetsu have always been an elusive and unpredictable as thunderclouds, that they sometimes they are sometimes long and sometimes short, like bolts of lightning. 
The problem, in fact, arose the moment we invented these, the two cat categories, Tom Pei Shosetsu and Chohen Shosetsu, which both lay claim to the Shosetsu and which are based on this sole distinguishing criterion of length. I have no clue who came up with these two categories or when, but when we, when we try applying these two terms to a number of works, it becomes clear their differences are not simply a matter of length. For instance, while we tend to regard Fyodor Dostoevsky's demons as a Chohen shows it's a long shows it's a, and Anatole France says the procurator of Judea as a Tampe shows it's a short so, shows it's a, nobody believes that shortening demons would suddenly transform it into a Tampe shows it's a, or that expanding the pro procurator of Judea would make it a Chohen shows it's a. We must never assume then that a mere change in quantity will necessarily produce a ch change in essential nature. Here, the two words are inherently different, and their differences have little to do with length. It seems our reliance on quantitative terms such as long, cho, and short, tang, to express substantive differences has only added confusion to our conception of the shosetsu. Our first order of business, then, should be to rectify the familiar terminology and then proceed to revise the accepted theory of the shosetsu. But alas, my task here, for better or worse, is not to postulate a new theory of the so-called Chohen or long Shosetsu, but simply to address in isolation this outfit called the Tampen or short Shosetsu. Yet, having already broached this issue of length, let me at least say a few words about the factors that determine the length of a work. Every Shosetsu, that is every piece of narrative fiction, possesses a determinate length. This is a fact too obvious to bear mentioning. What, but what is not so clear is what determines the length of each work. Some will say that the answer is simple, that due to various reasons, some works wind up long, while others wind up short. Others will, agree that, well, others will argue that we need not overthink the matter, since a work's length is simply decided, something decided by the editor's discretion. Still others will insist that length is determined by subject matter, that when the author's subject is light, the work will be short, and when his subject is heavy, the work will be long. Such opinions are all well and good, but they tell us nothing about how Shosetsu actually come into being. Then again, all who plunge headlong into the question of Genesis are likely to inflict only calamity upon the Shosetsu, as they will no doubt impose upon the form a host of arbitrary and capricious laws and unwarranted regulations. Though I assure you that this is not my intention, all the same, I do not think I do think it would do us all some good to run through the basics of how a shosetsu is created. When we stop for a moment to consider how spirit, that is the spirit the, that prompts the writer to creative exertion, is actually transmitted from the pen onto the page via words, it becomes clear that this creative process is always subject to the particular system of organization employed by the writer during the act of writing. Though there are myriad other forces that supervene into this process, we shall leave those aside for now. As for the methods involved in the show, such as composition, people have long held certain notions about how this creative process takes place, and these notions remain firmly entrenched today. These notions derive from a deep-seated popular belief that the writer's only sources for materials are those that already exist somewhere out in, there in the world, that these available materials are divisible into those that are suitable for shosetsu and those that are not, that the, that the chief task of the writer is simply to track down these available materials and then gather up those that best adhere to his own personal philosophy of writing, and then, when at last the time is ripe and his blood is hot, having waited patiently, sometimes for years on end, for the accumulation of rare materials he has stowed away in his, se in his secret treasure chest to ferment and brew in his psyche as a mark of his own interiority, the writer simply has to call upon his linguistic gifts and transfer, transfer his stockpile into the intended work. This popular myth is a perfect example of how a few half-baked ideas often become uncritically accepted as true. Yet I am dismayed less by the theory's pervasiveness than by its capacity to masquerade as the reigning orthodoxy for so long. If this theory of the pen were true, the writer would be no more than an expedient instrument that mechanically transcribes onto the page that which he has ascertained in advance, a spokesman who performs the tired stunt of reporting to the public that which his brain knows for certain. Of the extant cultural labors that employ the written word, much in fact has been manufactured in accordance with this foolish theory. But even if we grant that such 
labor contains some intrinsic value or merit, merit in its own right, the question nevertheless presents itself. Where can we draw the fundamental line of distinction between this kind of labor and the true shosetsu? Some believe the critical difference lies in degrees of artistry. But if this were the case, debates about the shosetsu would be no more than a forum for writers to prattle on about their own artistic struggles, which would be absurd considering that even third-rate authors know that shosetsu require more than artistic skill and sensitivity. Others point to subtle differences in perception, but such appeals are unconvincing too. Generally speaking, no matter how spectacular the subject matter or how sensitive the matter, manner of expression, when a work merely recounts what its author has already figured out prior to the pen, that is, when Le Effort de la Plume goes no further than the scheduled performance of some preconceived plot outline, then that work is, bet is no better than those countless forms of literature bungaka passed down to us from antiquity. If such merely ling literary labor were our only, our ultimate horizon, we would be hard put to explain why in our century this strange and unruly beast called the Shosetsu, whose gnarled face is like nothing we have hitherto seen, has at last begun to beat its great wings in noisy defiance. Some will smugly say that even pre-gested materials possess a unique charm once uh, when they have been skillfully rendered into words. But if this were true, that obsolete Meiji-era branch of philosophy dubbed the Gainin no Shosetsu, novels made of abstract notions, would still be alive and kicking, and we would have no special need to treat our nascent form of the Shosetsu proper as a special case. And do not burden me with that old saw about how Shosetsu are quote, the mimetic representations of life, or how novelists are the war correspondents on the battlefield of life. It would be a waste of time to enumerate why these old maxims of mimesis are so absurd. Let us instead entrust the earnest philosophizings of these admirable Meiji era scribes to the worthy reviews of the public, which stands apart from both literature and philosophy, Bungaku and Tetsugaku. But before we venture into this new realm, I urge you to remember that my main aim, my aim is not to force some presupposed principles upon the Shosetsu, but rather simply to direct your attention to a wholly simple and common natural fact concerning its composition, a certain universal force that all of us writers today find ourselves experiencing. Recalling my previous description, consider once again the, pre the process by which the work comes into being, viz. the correlation between the in-progress work and the writer engaged in the act of writing it. The writer begins by taking up the pen. At this point there occurs before him a clearing, in which he, as Alain Ch Chatier discovered, begins to think with the pen. Although Chatier's phrase is much bruited about in literary circles, it has yet to sink in with today's writers, despite the fame of his theory of prose. Instead, what usually happens is the reverse. The act of thinking precedes the act of writing. Allow me to give an example. In our everyday lives, our minds are incessantly turning in an endless stream of thoughts about a variety of matters in more or less random fashion, while walking, lying down, reading a book, chatting with a friend, burying ourselves in a busy crowd, or sitting in solitary repose with legs crossed, and whether in a frantic, riotous, fragmented, or systematic manner. And so here we are, say, sprawled out on our Davenport in our den, when some grand idea suddenly emerges out of the nebula of our wandering mind and instantly germinates. And moreover, let's say this idea contains within it a riveting plot that quickly unfolds into a series of highly dramatic scenes. At this point, many will assume that they have been bestowed with a, the seed for a shosetsu, that if they can just get their brush to copy down this thought, then it might sprout into a shosetsu. All of us have encountered those works that, whether replete with a terrific plot and highly dramatic scenes or not, were created in this manner, first cooked up in the author's head, or if you prefer, in the soles of his feet, and then smugly transcribed onto the page, as if writing a shosetsu were no different than dashing off a letter to a friend pleading, pleading for a loan. And yet we know full well that such works do not constitute a proper shosetsu. When the writer's ex 
expended labors amount to little more than a showy display of a secret stash of treasured materials, be they experiences, ideas, perceptions, or anything else, then the resulting work will have nothing to do with the true Shosetsu, even if it manages to pass as an instance of literature, Bungaka. Such works alter nobody's world view, exert no ex influence upon our Weltbild, our default world picture or con visual conception of the world, Sekaizo, and arouse no one but the conceited author himself, who fancies himself a modern day literati, who alone believes he has achieved something great. Prior to the pen, all that exists is dumb reality. Amid the phenomena of everyday life, the writer and his neighbor are painted in much the same hues. But whereas the neighbor quietly goes about his business calculating and tabulating matters according to the exigent demands of each day, the writer is fated to abide on a separate plane once removed from quotidian reality, where he is forced to think with the pen in a purely writerly mode. The tip of his pen is a kind of scalpel that severs him from all his various worldly connections, hurling his whole being into the unknown world of the work. I should caution that while some of his, this severed phenomenon, phenomena may later turn up in the work, not all of it is permitted free license to enter. The words of the writer, in, the words the writer inscribes soar far above the realm of his own ego, where they eventually merge with spirit. It is at this point that the writer, neither resting his pen to drum up some chic witticism that he will then transpose smugly onto paper, nor crudely foraging some philosophic truism to later winnow through the filter of reason, begins to think through the pen, unprepared and unprotected, on the very limits of language. To wit, the writer always starts off without knowing anything. As for those who insist on hauling into their works the rotten leftovers of what they have long known for certain, they should never be expected to carve open any new worlds. I bristle at the idea that the writer's task is simply to beam a flashlight on the existing objects of and entities of this world and then quickly trace over them with his pen before the battery expires. Prior to the pen, the only thing the writer apprehends with any certainty is the thick murk before him. In fact, this perception of murky darkness is the only immediate sensation the writer actually experiences in the course of writing. Thus, insofar as the path ahead is murky and obscure, the writer is never fully in control of the work. Or perhaps control is beside the point. The only thing the writer distinctly perceives is his own continuous effort, the aggregate effect of which is the world of his work. A common complaint about Dostoevsky's novels is that the new character will suddenly emerge halfway through the story, or that the work's main subject will abruptly veer off in an unexpected and unforeseen di direction. But even in this seemingly true, strange phenomenon, there is, in fact, a judicious law at work. Indeed, every Shulset worthy of the name Masterpiece has charted this course. French philosopher Henri Bergson the notion that our memory exists not within the folds of our brain but outside it has long been a matter of common sense to the experienced Shosetsu writer. For whenever a writer manages to churn out a few good lines, and all the more so when those lines contain a reality of their own, then the stuff embedded therein will sprout upward on its own accord, the constituent particles of the emergent world will cling together as if a magnetic field had formed along the trajectory of the writer's striving exertion, these newly amassed particles will then converge and participate with the movement of the preceding pages, and this aggregate cluster will continue to advance and accumulate, prompting further development. At this point, what good are those raw materials that the writer had rounded up and stowed away in advance? People often say that the show sets is a living thing, yet it lives only within the accelerating movement of the work itself, a movement analogous to a sequence of waves. And this sequence of waves occurs precisely at the border where the imminent darkness begins. Though in our everyday lives we all prefer to have our feet beneath us easily visible, that sort of illumination is not an option in the world of the Shosetsu. By now, at least one thing should be clear. The writer whose awareness of everyday values, his worldview, or Weltanschauung, was cast in the in large proportions befitting a titan, should not be expected to tread with ease into the realm of the Shosetsu on such gigantic feet. 
In short, all shows that to begin at the portal leading into the dark, and where they end too can only be within this darkness. The show set is not some convenient machine that promises to disclose some hitherto unknown model of the universe at the moment of its completion. The writer's creative exertion can depart only from a state of knowing, at times catching a tantalizing glimpse of some speck of knowledge, at times abruptly disrupted before any knowledge is gained. Yet the fact of the matter is that this exertion must remain in continuous motion in order to perdure. The moment a show sets ends is the moment the writer's exerted effort has somehow exceeded the world of the in-progress work and hit upon some new, uncharted frontier. It is as though the optical phenomenon that we call the show sets comes into being while this effort spins about in orbit around the author's felt build, his sekaizo, his underlying pictorial conception of the world, probing for some yet unknown law or formula of the cosmos. The writer's own ego or psychology, Shindi, is merely an impediment that obscures and obstructs the perdurance of his creative energies and effort. And the less the authorial ego intervenes, the better and purer the work will be qua shosetsu. Generally speaking, what sustains the world of the work is not the author's individual ego, but rather this, this trans-individual substance called spirit, shin, seishin. The writer cannot merge with spirit except by severing his own ego, shindi. And it is only through confrontation with the real that spirit can take shape and become manifested in the work. The only immediate sensation the writer experiences during the process of creation is that of the looming darkness that appears before him. Yet no sooner does the world of the work start to appear than a small strip of expanding light begins to flicker at each new inch of this dimly unfolding world. Metaphors, especially blunt ones, are best avoided when discussing the shosetsu. But from a practical standpoint, I see no harm in likening the shosetsu to a sequence of waves of water or light. The world of the shosetsu is abruptly terminated the moment the writer's creative effort manages to extend beyond the world of the work, and the length of the work at this point of termination is equivalent to the length of that single protracted wave of light that unfolds as the writer weaves together these tiny particles called words. And what better way to describe the length of this single protracted wave of light than to say, recycling my earlier phrase, that it is determined by the particular system of creative organization employed by the writer in the act of writing. Though the specific patterns of these configurations are contingent upon a specific time and place, the writer can only become cognizant of these changing patterns by going back through his work once it is completed and surveying the traces. If you will allow me yet another metaphor, I shall liken the tip of a pen to an ele electrode that discharges a stream of electrons, for this should give you some indication of just how difficult it is to predict the exact configurations of this volatile electric, electrical field. And the kicker comes when you realize that this unwieldy thing called the Shosetsu is an even more unpredictable and unruly phenomenon than electricity. Clearly, my description so far has revealed little about the Shosetsu's true essence. But then again, it was never my goal to provide such an explanation. Instead, I have sought only to show how each how even the most cursory description can render it even more obscure and further confound the whole discussion, and also to show how broader questions about the subtle workings of language, evaluations of specific works, and so forth are a separate set of issues altogether. My aim has simply been to give my my aim has been simply to give a brief account of the common quantitative measure of length, while taking no account of questions of the show such as essential nature. For this reason, I have deferred all inquiry into the singular qualities of individual works and also refrained from making the impru impudent, impudent assertion that even a town ben shosetsu can achieve the status of peerless masterpiece, or kessaku. Only an unscrupulous fool would claim that his heap of scribblings constitutes a proper shosetsu simply because of, of the number of pages. Still, we would all do well to know that a certain minimum length is imperative for a shosetsu to be a shosetsu. 
Though little more than a sweeping generalization, my explanation in its own sweeping way should provide you with some insight into how a show sets it comes into being and also establish that which determines also establish that what determines its length is embryonically rooted in that very process. This is of course not some brash claim to an original discovery on my part, but rather only a modest attempt to reawaken and reconfirm that strong, if nebulous, commonsensical understanding of the Chosetsu that you, dear readers, have long possessed. Now I shall proceed to my main argument. Just note that the so-called Chohen Chosetsu, or Long Chosetsu, is still outside my jurisdiction, and with regard to those splendid short works under two or three hundred manuscript pages written in accordance with the process I just described, I shall hereafter refer to this type as Mijigai Shousetsu, or a bona fide Shousetsu that just happens to be short. Our present topic of discussion, however, is not the short, short Shousetsu proper, Mijigai Shousetsu, but rather that peculiar outfit called the Tampen Shousetsu. Are these two types really the same? To assert that they are would be to commit ourselves once again to meaningless taxonomy. But in fact, the situation compels our interest precisely because these two terms do not match up. Indeed, most existing Tanpen Shosetsu only defy the creative methods of the Miji Gai Shosetsu from their very first lines. This may sound like a contradiction in light of my statements thus far, but I ask that you bear with me, for these next few pages should make clear that this detour was not entirely justified. Let us now explore, then, the defining features of this Tanpen Shosetsu. Part 2. What constitutes a Tanpen Shosetsu? Some thoughts on the term. In Japan, the term Tanpen, in the taxonomical use of this adjective short, first came into Japan into widespread use in the Meiji period. The term was probably introduced as a translation of the English term short story. I'm not sure when the term first appeared in the Anglophone world, but it must have been well after the establishment of the French terms roman, nouvelle, and conte. By after the establishment, I mean after those three terms acquired the meanings they carry today. Since the so-called tampem seems to consist mainly of two types, the novel and the conte, I shall take these as my starting point, leaving aside the roman for our purposes here. Brevity is an essential condition of neither the novel nor the conte, but we can usually predict where their seams will be cut. Both generally run for from two to three hundred pages of ma handwritten manuscript, but it's not uncommon to come across works under a hundred pages. Moreover, the novel and the conte are not distinguishable by any difference in length. The term chuhen, or mid-length, shosetsu, was apparently invented at some point as a translation of novel, but this designation too is utter nonsense. There seems to be a tendency to regard the novel as longer than the conte, and this tendency has led to the gradual reduction in the Kant's length, ultimately producing that last-ditch bizarre category called Shohen Shosetsu, Palm of the Hand Stories. I occasionally get commissioned by little journals to write these miniature stories, which are basically seven or eight-page Kant's. These products are bumped up to the status of short stories when they run between 15 or and 20 pages, but what, just what sagacious gentleman of leisure came up with this arbitrary classif system of classification, I do not know, but it truly is an idiotic system. After all, even a quick glance at Gustave Flaubert's Très, Très Contes will show you that the Kant is not limited to 10 or 15 pages. Though I just start, stated that Kant's generally run between two and 300 pages, in fact, there's no need to bind ourselves to these numbers and we shouldn't be surprised to discover a cont that runs upwards of 500 pages. Nevertheless, we would all do well to note the simple fact that both cons and nouvelles are constituted in such a way as to never cons continue beyond a certain prescribed length. Should any of you get into your heads to write a thousand page cont, by all means have at it, but I can assure you that you will not make it very far. And if, by some miracle, you make it to page 1000, I will wager again that the fruit of your labor will no longer bear any semblance to the Kant. But perhaps such blanket statements do not sit well with some of you. In that case, allow me to offer you two tentative definitions, one for the nouvelle and one for the Kant, and then explain the creative procedures of each. To repeat, the nouvelle and the Kant are distinguished not by any difference 
by difference in quantity, but a, by a distinction in nature. Our present task would be far easier if we could simply prop up a definition of each type, explain their respective qualitative differences, and then conclude that this umbrella term, Tom Bainshul's etc., consists of these two dual strands. But the trouble is that even such attempts at qualitative differentiation often prove useless, so we are in perpetual danger of bringing disorder and confusion to our discussion of the Tom Bainshul's etc. through our own stubborn biases. Anticipating this future confusion, I shall offer the following two definitions. Keep in mind that my definitions are only preliminary, and that I have formulated them as simply as possible. Nouvelle, that sentimental literary form which aims to give readers some emotional release by organizing shards of human passions, ninjo, and social mores, fuzoka, into a concrete visual pattern, onto which a consciousness of daily life is then superimposed. Kant. That literary form which aims to induce a shudder in readers by spinning a strange, impromptu idea into a plot that cleverly outwits the conventional view of life. These two main types of Tom Bainshaw's will vary to differing degrees depending on the work, and in some cases they may, have, they may contain various conceptual, poetical, rhetorical, and other elements that have nothing to do with pure prose. At least this is how it seems to me at present. A blatantly bad precursor to the Kant can be found in that onerous genre of adult comic prints from the mid-Edo period known as the Kibyoshi. I suppose one could say that Ukiyo Zoshi, Stories of the Floating World, Hachimonjiya books, Hyaku Monogate, Hundred Tales, Ghost Stories, Sharebon Fashion Books, and the other short literary genres of the Edo period were all more or less precursors to the modern day Kant. But even so, we should nonetheless recognize that the moment this foul prankster called the Kibyoshi appeared in the mid-Edo period to usurp the title of Kant, the stylish old Sharebon, which had hitherto sat alongside the Kibyoshi, was absorbed into the new genre of the mawkishly sentimental Ninjo Bon, which eventually morphed into the modern novel. While this is neither the time nor place to conduct a method methodical comparative study of the myriad differences among these early Japanese uh, prose genres. If we limit our scope to these three main genres, the Sharibon fashion books, the Ninjobon melodramas, and the Kibyoshi comic prints, we can clearly see that the Sharibon corresponds to the modern-day Kant, the Ninjobon corresponds to the modern-day Nouvelle, and the lone wolf known as the Kibyoshi soon came to eclipse the Sharibon status as Kant by poaching all its Kant-like elements. Thus, the history of the various genres of soft erotic literature, or nam bungaku, of the mid-Edo period is precisely the story of the development and destruction of its greatest prose genre, the Sharebon, satirical books about male adventures in the licensed quarters. It is no small wonder then that the Ninjobon was the only genre of the Edo period that managed to survive until the present day, first by obstinately swimming along in the undercurrent of Meiji literature, and then more recently by residing in some dank corner of our ill-formed modern literature that prides itself on how far it has evolved. Hopefully, this brief overview gives you a sense of three things. How the novel and the Kant, in fact, constitute the core of our modern literature, how they have conspired or alternately engaged with each other in the face of their new shared arch enemy, the Shosetsu proper, and by extension how through these two forms, the Shosetsu proper and literature, Bungoku, are today pitted against each other in an all-out struggle to the death. But before we delve into these issues, let us dwell for a bit at the point where these two short literary forms called the Novelle and the Kant came into being, and then briefly consider their processes of creation. Recall now the mode of genesis I described in the previous section. Employing a bit of imagination, consider those works that were produced via the inverse procedure. Indeed, it is these types of works that make up the vast majority. By inverse procedure, I mean a creative process whereby everything takes place prior to the pen. That is to say, prior to the pen, the f fermentation of the author the fermentation of the author's amassed stockpile of materials in his own psyche conspire together as he waits for some external impetus to prompt him to write. The plot comes into focus, the motifs start to take form, 
Then, having already concocted the blueprint for the world of his work some time ago, perhaps on the tip of his distinguished nose, the author finds himself in a state of elation, giddily admiring his own sublime artistry that has somehow managed to bring everything together in his hot palm that dashes across the page in frantic search of one fashionable phrase after the next, while making no real effort with his pen, which remains diffuse and scattered. Anyone who follows my two tentative definitions and strives to produce two works in the manner I've prescribed will soon enough have before him a prototype for the novel and a prototype for the conte, irrespective of the author's, author's intelligence and the work's quality. But before you rejoice at having discovered that these two Tom Bain show sets of types are really so easy to produce, know this. Even the most elaborately designed novels and contes are doomed to mediocrity so long as their actual substance was conceived prior to the pen. Again, I shall refrain from making the provocative claim that the great works among them are an exception to this universal rule. When a novelle or conte does truly achieve the status of peerless masterpiece, its greatness has nothing to do with the elaborate designs and plans of its author. Rather, a peerless masterpiece is something that bursts forth suddenly and without warning, regardless of the author's own designs and plottings. So long as a writer can keep his pen moving forward, he may someday have the good fortune of turning out a masterpiece in spite of himself. But oh how rare such phenomena are. When it comes to this strange outfit called the Tampen Shosetsu, you may take comfort in the fact that they require so little real creative effort to produce. It is enough that the sudden desire to produce one should occur to you at some point. Indeed, this mysterious force called inspiration, so highly esteemed in the past, still beats its wings over both the novel and the conte. Imagine how easy our task would be if we could also turn our authentic, turn out authentic shows such as simply by riding atop its borrowed wings. And so, whatever designations we employ, whatever taxonomy we adopt, and whether we are talking about the conte or the novel, we can be certain of one thing. The world represented in the Tompein Shosets is always a kind of world whose every constituent part, down to every last minutia and pinpoint detail, is under the complete control of its author. The Tompein author, master of his domain, whether in cool composure or a state of frenzy, sets about to write only after he has safely prepared from the outset some clever final punchline or tear-jerking scene. The safe course of his pen has been decided and mapped out from the start as if wooden stakes had been planted to guide him along. Consequently, it is only natural that the resultant work should be precluded from extending beyond a certain length. Every form and species whose very mode of genesis has barred them from continuing beyond a certain length get lumped together under this generic catch-all term, Tom Bain shows it. Uh, in all these forms, the author does not take any risks. He does not think with the pen, as Chantier exhorted. Rather, he simply allows his pen's movement to be directed by certain abstract philosophical notions and concepts that he has tucked away in the bosom, in his bosom pocket for incubation and breeding. Instead of carving out a new world inch by inch in the darkness ahead, he coolly waits for the borders of some promised land to become visible beyond, then making sure all of his conveniently cold materials are ready at hand, he simply rounds up and selects his words as finishing touches pretty flourishes. The success of a contour novel depends entirely upon the degree of harmony that undergirds the world of the work. This harmony is not the harmony or discord that the pen finds at the end of a long hard struggle, but rather a harmony forged by the author's ideas and expectations about how the world works, formulated prior to the pen. This harmony is then mechanically poured into the work, itself the, sh itself the mere snapshot copy or simulation of that preconceived harmony. Harmony exists prior to the work's conception, avant le lettre, as it were. It never comes into consultation with the pen, but instead merely stands ready inside the author's brain, assuming it is the brain that performs this function, waiting to be called upon to lock the work into place. This is why the author's particular modes of seeing and living will always instantaneously disrupt and distort the world of his work. We often hear readers speak glowingly of an author's personality, seeing how it is precisely so-and-so's noble character that makes his works so rich and dignified. Yet this sort of logic, in fact, cuts both ways, for readers can be unflattering as well, saying, for example, that while a certain author's works may be cleverly written, his immature or naive or boring personality makes them unreadable. And yet, our world being vast, there will always be those devoted fans who love even the author's filthiest parts, his body odor even. 
and praise his stench as positively top-notch. Indeed, it is thanks to these readers that authors can live long and prosper by simply hawking piecemeal their individual flair, quote-unquote. Some of these authors even think they can compensate for the lack of versatility by doggedly sticking to their familiar subjects, rehashing again and again the same old song and dance. Put simply, such so-called show sets are come in two varieties, those that take as their main subject the author himself, and those that take as their subject the aesthetic hypostatization of the author's preconceived notions and concepts. Let us call the former the author-centric type, and the second the literary philosophic type. We can argue till the cows come home about which of these two types will prevail, but at this, at this point the true Shosetsu has already been lost somewhere along the way. The sentient pen, the looming darkness ahead, the exertion of spirit, these essential conditions of the Shosetsu proper are all entirely missing from the picture. In short, neither of the two existing categories reveal anything about the true identity of the Shosetsu. But then again, as I pledged at the start of this essay, I shall refrain from attempting to formulate my own theory of the true Shosetsu. So let me instead use this opportunity to offer a simple warning. Insofar as the proverbial eye of the author goes no further than the facile perception of everyday life, then it is dangerous to assume that this same eye can also perceive into the realm of the Shosetsu. If you are inclined to boast about how acute your eyes have become and how refined your writing has grown through a combination of personal toil and study, then you should also should have realized by now that the Shosetsu constitutes an altogether separate universe from our everyday visible world. So how then are these two issues, harmony and length, related in the two types of the so-called Tamben Shosetsu? I have no desire to discuss this relation at length. In fact, I'm not even sure that there exists anything special deserving of the name relation. Yet I will say one thing about this subject. When the writer attempts to impose some preconceived lexical aesthetic gestalt onto that which he has already apprehended, that which he has already assembled in his head as a unified whole, this will inexorably give rise to a quantitative restriction that prevents his work from exceeding two or three hundred, or at most five hundred, handwritten pages. This assertion requires no fancy logic for substantiation or qualification. It is a simple basic truth that I have gleaned from reading numerous works of literature from both the East and the West. No need to pour over the entire canon of world literature. A quick scan of a few famous works will suffice. To phrase it somewhat differently, it is a plain and fundamental truth that a man's brain is able to systemize and, and control the world of his work only when that world is under when that work is under two or three hundred pages. Above I asserted that virtually anyone can cobble together these two forms called a content and novel. Let me now make another assertion. Just bear in mind that I shall include from my com exclude from my commentary that other type that I provisionally dubbed the Mijikai Shosetsu, the short Shosetsu, short Shosetsu proper in the previous section, and also exempt those popular works written by artless hucksters who strive to make their works as long as possible in order to procure more money. To wit, any Tampen Shosetsu that possesses harmony is by definition beautiful. What sustains beauty in the Tampen is the harmony prescribed by the author's preconceptions about the world. What element then, you will no doubt ask, serves to bring together all the author's accumulated materials when it comes time to flesh out these preconceived notions. This is precisely the job of the moral. As with harmony, the Tom Penn's moral is not some unknown, unknown law that the pen can or has yet to discover at the limits of the author's creative exertion, but rather something that always conforms to the extant norms and laws pre-inscribed into the world. Morals that appear in Tom Penn's shows that may assume various guises, however, austere, inverted, esoteric, heavy-handed, and so forth, depending on the author's mood. It is as though the author, having already snatched from the external world not only his materials, but his ready-made moral as well, is now free to exploit his pet moral in whatever manner he sees fit. Of the novels I have read, their morals, or more precisely, the author's moral stances on a variety of subjects, generally reveal themselves in an explicit and straightforward way. That is, the author's own personal views and opinions about the world's established moral codes tend to come across clearly and directly. 
at times even in spite of his coy denials and intentions. Authors of novels have, may have a strong penchant for boasting about how accurately they can depict, depict the lived or staged phenomena of human experience, and they may generally plant their morals deep enough into the story so as not to be too glaringly obvious. But given the fact that no two things are as agonistically entwined as lived experience and morals, the hidden thread of their moral sensibility will always come into view sooner or later, no matter how hard they try to conceal it. Paradoxically, the more deeply their novel is rooted in lived everyday experience, the more trenchant a critique of that quotidian life it will be, and the better the composition, the more potent the critique. This clo close-knit relation between everyday life and morality is why the authors of no no novels can never really conceal their own moral biases and judgments. Even those urbane aesthetes who eschew the use of morals in their story and go to great lengths to draw up a purely objective panorama of the customs of society often end up receiving a withering rebuke from the conservative establishment, makers of state-sponsored morality. This basic structure is why novels are always fated to descend into petty moralizing, even when they commence from a position that privileges stylistic versatility and artistic technique. Even the writer who scribbles away in naive oblivion for hours on end will eventually reach the point where his selected materials start to dictate the way he writes. For no form of literature is, is as eager as the novel to sacrifice its author to the hands of morality, regardless of the author's own intentions. Even the most morally upstanding novel author will find himself unwittingly inching toward immorality the more he tries to avoid moralizing. Perhaps this is one of the novel's more interesting aspects. In the case of the Kant, the moral enters the work from the very start and forms the core of its raw material. The conteur takes a single moral of undefined content as his nucleus and then surrounds it with various shards of various phenomena from his life until the whole thing crystallizes into a single ion, the whole of which we refer to as the Kant. Fusing his chosen moral into each tiny particle of this world, the contour swells proudly at the beauty of the world he's created, and yet all the while he remains utterly indifferent toward whatever actual moral he has recycled and exploited for his own aesthetic purpose, says. There are also those contours who are fond of appending to the end of the story a short seemingly wise aphorism or witticism, but for the most part, such ploys are no more than an obvious attempt to impress readers by capriciously postulating a fabricated situation that simply mirrors the moral prejudices of the age. The morals themselves are nothing we have not already seen. In short, they do not constitute a new discovery of a new universal law. When the contour fails in this ploy, the ending of his cont is no better than the stale sage or final punchline of a third-rate Dakugo comic raconteur. Personally, I have no bone to pick with the conteur who churns out a hundred cons, each showcasing a different moral. Indeed, readers of such cons will applaud their author's abundant versatility and moral promiscuity. In the world of the cont, the only thing that matters is craftsmanship. As long as the climactic fireworks go off without a hitch, all other concerns can be forgotten. There can be no such thing as a beautiful failure. Do not waste your time reading botched cons. Their authors are little more than half-wits. The prolific contour who manages to turn out successful cons year after year may think he has achieved great status, yet the reality is quite different. Even among the most highly acclaimed conteurs, very few are lucky enough to die, ripe, die of ripe old age after putting out a lifetime's worth of exquisite cons. More often they go insane like Guy de Maupassant, or hang themselves like Gérard de Naval. Naval. The only reason Ueda Akinari managed to live to long outlive the publications of his works was that he had the prudent foresight to toss down the well the original drafts of his later years. To sum up, no matter how we subdivide or dissect this form known as the Tampen Shosetsu, the success or failure of each individual work will always depend on the author's degree of craftsmanship in depicting what already exists out there in the world, what he is already fully cog 
recognized. Since each work constitutes an actual living entity with its own unique properties, some works may occasionally violate this or that secondary regulation regarding subdivision, yet none is exempt from this basic common law. And though I may have just claimed that no beautiful failure can ever occur in a Kant, the same is true of both types of Tampe and Shosetsu. For the ultimate goal of the novel and the Kant is the formal beauty and realized perfection of the completed work. And so long as this goal is reached, it would be senseless and boorish to bicker over the traces of how the work was created, traces that are bound to disappear anyway. Well-crafted Tampen will always reach the exalted kingdom of art. Authors of these successful works will always have this future to look forward to. The less talented ones, meanwhile, will continue to lament their misfortune, Although they never dare direct their they never dare direct their curses at this entrenched generic concept called art itself. Indeed, it really is quite a system. It all started long ago, when some Greek philosopher issued the famous maxim, "Art is the imitation of life." This remark soon became accepted as a natural and timeless truth, a mantra that remains deeply entrenched today. The Tom Penn Shilsitsa has been doggedly trudging down this path laid out by this maxim ever since its emergence as a form. Contours are now even experimenting with a kind of inverted imitation, Hantai Mohang, acting out in real life their own fabrications. Just open up any textbook on the subject of art and you will find the same thing. A pyramid structure with this umbrella generic concept called art, Gejitsa, sitting at the apex, under which are included all the various, subspe no, various species of subconcept items. Literature, of course, is one of them. Bungaku. In its earlier evolutionary stages, the Shosetsu too belonged to this genealogy as one branch of the subspecies called bungaku literature. But in recent years, the shosetsu has begun to grow in an unexpected and unforeseen way, suggesting that a fundamental shift has started to take place within, the very, within its very concept, to the point that it is now clearly no longer content with having its original official title conferred upon it from its former master sovereign literature. Does this rift bespeak a confrontation between the two species subconcepts of the Shosetsu and Bungaka? Or is the Shosetsu, having at last defected from the fusty old genealogy of art, now firmly set upon establishing itself as an autonomous, sui generis genere, uh, concept? Though I shall leave aside such cons questions for now, I will note that it does seem reasonable to keep the two types of Tampen under the rubric of literature, given that, even today, their practitioners still aspire to the lofty status of art. And indeed, those writers who piously contrive to portray a slice of life in 50 pages should not hesitate when calling themselves artists. Just know that once the discussion has de degenerated to this point, their works no longer have anything to do with the show sets of proper, and that in itself is a great burden lifted from my mind. In sum, despite its name, this form known as the Tampen Shosetsu actually has nothing to do with the Shosetsu as such. Rather, it is better understood as a subset of the old genus called Bungaka or literature. Echoing our national fondness for abbreviating all things, there has recently emerged a tendency to refer to the Tampen Shosetsu simply as Tampen, shorts or shorties, dropping the term Shosetsu altogether. I find much to praise about this tendency. You will no doubt wonder, then, whether this means that the bond between the Tampen and the, ta the Shosetsu proper has finally been severed once and for all. Not quite, for the two cannot be sundered so easily. There are three reasons why they can never be severed. First, the fraught relationship between the Shosetsu narrative fiction and Bungaku literature is far too old and complex. Second, the Tampen Shosetsu is still of great consequence as a species that came about while the Shosetsu was still in its infancy. And third, that other form that I have provisionally dubbed the Mijikai Shosetsu, a Shosetsu proper that ha happens to be short, is inextricably intertwined with the Tampen. It is at this point, when we have confirmed their fundamental inseparability, that the really interesting discussion begins. 
It may even be the case that this bizarre outfit called the Tom Ben has in fact never performed as critical a role as it does today. What remains for us to explore now then is the complex relationship between the so-called Tom Ben Shosetsu and the Shosetsu proper. Part 3. The Realm of the Tom Ben Shosetsu. The novel or Shosetsu is still young. Pre-modern man may have composed poems and songs about nymphs and shepherds, but he never wrote Shosetsu. The novel did not come about as an established form until human culture had made considerable progress. Yet no sooner did it appear than it veered off in a direction that nobody had anticipated. The novel did, however, pass through its own primitive phase. Initially, novels were meant to be experienced not only through the eyes, but also through the voice and ears. Early experimenters in the form no doubt wrote their words down on paper, but they did so while envisioning themselves before an audience. Similarly, early fans of the shosetsu would either read these shosetsu aloud, whether in a shout or a whisper, or they would listen to someone, say the author himself or a third party, recite the shosetsu. The audience's primitive mode of reception and the author's primitive mode of composition maintained perfect equilibrium with each other as shosetsu after shosetsu appeared, after, as, as shosetsu after shosetsu appeared and disappeared, floated and sank through the decades. Indeed, it was in this fashion that the literary salons of early modern France functioned. Whatever role the salons performed, it was in this milieu, uh, milieu of direct audience-author interaction that the shosetsu was fostered. This all changed with the development of print, which had a profound effect on the subsequent fate of the shosetsu. Standardized print not only transformed the form and nature of the shosetsu, it also radically affected the way shosetsu authors worked in the medium, even if the authors themselves were often aware of the, unaware of these changes. And this seismic shift eventually caused the novel or shosetsu to slough off its old skin and reinvent itself as something entirely new. These profound if subtle variations and effects have only recently begun to show themselves, or at least it is only in recent years that writers themselves have begun to take note of them. Who among us today does not get a sense that shosetsu of late are radically different from those of the past? Even if someone were to den deny that he feels this change, he could not deny that our mode of reading shosetsu has radically changed in some ineffable way. These days, a shosetsu is regarded as such only after it has been rendered into movable type, katsuji, literally liter living words or characters, and reproduced for mass consumption. A tacit procedure has been universally agreed upon whereby the writer scribbles away in silence, the reader reads his work in silence, and a mute negotiation occurs between the two parties through printed words. Who today would think of reading a show that's allowed? If by chance you're inclined to challenge me on this, by all means do. See how, just how far you can get. I can tell you from this most reliable and trustworthy thing called first-hand experience that your voice will take a beating after two, a few pages. And indeed it does. Um, and should you somehow survive the experience, this would only be a public admission that you had no idea what you just read. <clears throat> so what exactly then is this thing called the Shosetsu that is transformed, or at least seems to be transforming, in this new direction? To date, no one has ever answered this question adequately. And yet at the same time, no one grapples with this question more intensely than the writer himself. Indeed, it is this very question that drives us to write. What we call the Shosetsu is precisely that which comes about from the writer's efforts to grasp the Shosetsu's true nature. We may never come to understand the novel or Shosetsu's true nature, yet we already know a great deal about this outfit called the Tampen Shosetsu. We already know, for example, when the form first came into the world, at the start of the 19th century, shortly after the French Revolution. This periodization remains fixed no matter how many antecedent works are cited. This, it, it, it was in the, these late decades of the 18th century that the Tampen Shosetsu first established itself as a distinct, autonomous form. Any earlier short works that you might want to submit for admission as short stories can only be got done so retroactively. Just remember that length alone does not qualify a work as Tampen Shosetsu. There's no point in arguing, for instance, that the relatively short 
Tsutsumi Chunagon Monogatai, Tales of the Riverside Middle Counselor, written in the 11th century, or the sh short prose works of Ihara Saikaku, which predate the Napoleonic era by more than a century, should be regarded as Tanpen Shosetsu. It would make for a much better literary study to trace the movement of the myriad prose forms of Japan from a, the day of Saikaku to the present. But since this is neither the time nor the place to conduct a full literary history of these short prose forms of Japan, the following simple point will have to suffice for our current discussion. Given that the Tanpen Shosetsu emerged, emerged as a form well after the establishment of movable type, it was only natural that it should come to be written and read in silence and in accordance with the laws of print. print. And yet, at the same time, the Tanpen Shosetsu was also fated never to be able to extricate ex itself from the lingering voice of the previous epoch, the quaint, melodic voices of the French salons. Tethered to this primitive orality, the Tanpen Shosetsu made its way to the present epoch where it now finds itself caught between its own increasingly complex nature and the effects of a print-dominated age that together render its situation all the more tangled and, and confusing. Here I would ask you to recall my description at the end of the previous section about the fundamental inextricability between the Tanpen Shosetsu and the Shosetsu proper, and then consider whether all instances of the Tanpen Shosetsu extant masterpieces among them included, are necessarily disqualified from attaining the status of Shosetsu proper simply because they have now exclaimed, they have now reclaimed, because they have now been reclaimed into the aegis, aegis of literature, bungaku. In answering this question, I shall exclude the innumerable examples of mediocre cons and novels and restrict myself to the exceptional masterpieces among them. My answer is that no Tanpen Shosetsu can ever attain the status of Shosetsu proper insofar as it excels solely in terms of formal beauty, no matter how extraordinary it be as a work of literature. Those cons and or novels that we consider masterpieces hold that position only to the degree that they contain a certain measure of truly Shosetsu-like Qualities. These alone are the qualities that have always moved and that have always moved and will always move their readers. That leads us to our next question. Just what exactly are these Shosetsu like qualities lurking in novels and cons? No matter what form a writer adopts or what system he employs, the moment he commences to write, he cannot escape being punished by the ironclad laws of the pen. We may summarily disregard that scraggly band of mediocre writers whose fates are bound together by loose karmic ties. The good writers of every epoch, uh, the good writers of every epoch, are those who quickly learn to rely not on some borrowed form or adopted method, but on the unconscious workings of the pen itself. That pen that is the conduit through which they all at some point begin to think. To put this somewhat differently, even those writers who subscribe to the method I explained in section 2 of this essay will at some point inadvertently switch over to the method I described in section 1. It is precisely at such moments that we, feel, we can feel the writer being yanked along by his pen, with the result that he sometimes finds himself clutching at God's feet or Satan's tail. The sections of the work produced in this way will have attained the height of the true Shosetsu even when they are ensconced within the novel or the Kant. Moreover, in the case of the truly great writers, even when they are working in the medium of the Tanpen, the entire work itself, and not just some scattered Shosetsu-like parts of it, will at times end up achieving the status of a bona fide Shosetsu even when its author had originally set out to create a work of mere literature. Here again, we see that the great writers are never really conscious of their own methods. Today, we may f be far more conscious of these laws of the pen than writers of the past ever were. And yet, to our great inconvenience, this fact does not make it any easier for us to produce a, a masterpiece. Even if someone to were to discover some law or formula proving that masterpieces always smile in the direction of the unconscious, our knowledge of this law would not make our task as writers 
any easier. And so it seems we can finally put aside this strange outfit called the Tom Benchelsetze now that it has returned quietly to its original home, that old subgenre of art called literature bungaku, where it shall linger on indefinitely. All of its poetical, oratorical, and other non-pure prose elements will neatly break down and return to their na natural home, allowing only its pure prose elements to remain. Then it will split cleanly into two halves, the show sets of proper and literature bungaku. Whereupon this newly distilled pure prose will suddenly be lifted and transplanted into the former as if some unknown cosmic force had, but alas, it is precisely because the form cannot be divided so easily that the reality of its situation is so amusing. For even as the Tampen shows that the surges forward, surges forth as an undivided whole in a constant swirl, its atoms simultaneously splitting and recoalescing, that other worthy form I tentatively dubbed the Mijigai Shosetsu, which resembles the former only in terms of quantity, starts to flicker into view, rendering the whole situation doubly or triply complex to the common eye. Yet it is precisely at this point that the conventional view of the untrained layman's eye, and not the expert view of the well-trained expert eye, proves itself more insightful. more shrewdly capable of perceiving the actual truth of the situation. Thus, we must drop the term Miji Kai Shosetsu altogether and simply call it by its true name, Shosetsu proper. Once again, we have confirmed that the length never mattered much in, dis in discussions of the Shosetsu anyway. In the case of the Tampen Shosetsu, this issue of length was simply the case of publishers announcing from time to time that so-called long shosetsu, chohen shosetsu, are no longer fashionable, whereupon market-conscious authors would respond by putting out a spate of shorter works. Yet we must not assume that chohen shosetsu qualify as authentic shosetsu simply because the tampen has at last returned, at least in part, to its native home, the domain of literature, bungaka. In fact, the vast majority of chohen shosetsu are, more than, are no more than sordid, thickly colored melodramas that belong on the lowest rungs of literature. When you ask publishers whether this exchange applies only to works of literature, they will insist it applies to shosetsu as well. And when you ask whether their notion of shosetsu belongs to so whether their shosetsu belongs to the domain of commercial literature, taishu bungaku, or pure literature, Jumbungaku, they will assert that they are talking, what they are talking about is not other than pure literature itself. Whatever designation, designation they use, the mechanisms of this commercial exchange, mechanism of this commercial exchange has been, long been tried and tested. Writers continue to turn out works in a similar vein. Publishers continue to promote them lavishly. Readers keep buying and reading them, perhaps less, less lavishly. And for better or for worse, this established business arrangement constitutes the current situation of literature in Japan today. Though there are some who malign the practice, the general consensus is that our literature is in good shape. Perhaps it is those of us who refuse to subscribe to this layman's view who are the real fools. So let us train our untrained layman eyes more carefully upon what is been become of the more carefully upon what has become of the Tanpen form in Japan since the Meiji period. In the interest of brevity, we shall ignore all the disputations and controversies over the generic notion of the Shosetsu that occurred prior prior to the Meiji era and limit our focus, just as we did in the previous section, to the novel and the Kant. In actuality, not a single Kant existed in Japan in the early Meiji period, the heyday of the Kenyusha writers. The only prose genre that existed back then was the novel, and what is commonly and erroneously called the modern Japanese novel. Let us now attempt then to trace the genealogy of the Japanese novel. I noted earlier that the Ninjo Bone was the only literary relic from the Edo period to survive intact into the Meiji period. Allow me to elaborate. Whatever cosmetic changes the Ninjo Bone underwent, this mel melodramatic genre was the only legacy passed down from the Edo period in terms of actualized literary works. 
No need to count on your fingers all the outstanding writers to the letter of the Edo period whom you regard as more distinguished than Tamiyanaga, Shunsi, and taught up a list of their works. This is not to exalt Shunsi himself, but simply to underscore that it was his preferred literary medium, the Ninjo Bon melodrama, that alone survived, in essence, into the Edo or into the early Meiji period. No, ne nor need we obfuscate the explanation by hinting at all the possible reasons for the form's survival. The Ninjo Bon survived for four reasons. First, its own historical era was close to ours. Second, its influential its influence as a popular form was still making itself felt in the late Edo period. Third, the human passions, ninjo, and social mores and manners, fuzoka, that constitute its main materials, including in particular the language it employed, were still alive in early Meiji. And fourth, the Weltanschauung of its writers closely resembled that of the Kenyusha school of the Meiji period. It is in this way that the Kenyusha writers were the true heirs of the literary genre of the ninjo bon a genre that depends entirely on external materials drawn f from everyday life. The Kenyusha writers' main materials can be divided into three types. Human feelings, ninjo, social customs, fuzoka, and the romanticized views of human character, jōjō teki ningenzō, concomitant to these. In the final analysis, the principal achievement of this literary movement, which marked the birth of Japan's first truly modern voice, was the uncanny ability of his writers to compose the narrative passages in a slangy vernacular that matched the dialogue passages, something that had not been done before. Although they flat out rejected the term ninjobong, adjusted their main materials and backgrounds to fit the times, and acquired some knowledge of foreign languages, their pro popular novels showed no special deviation from the ninjo bon love stories of previous eras. However, they did display an extreme singularity in two other re regards. First, they made it their mission to hunt and gather raw materials from their everyday lives with the specific goal of writing shosetsu through their literary creation. And second, they openly flaunted this divine mission as their er own original discovery. In short, what the Kenyusha writers self-consciously invented was none other than the life-mirroring literary form known as the model, model shosetsu, model shosetsu. And it is precisely this form that led us right into our present predicament, which I shall get to shortly. Thus, in the second half of the Meiji period, there began to emerge a new hermeneutics of literary materials. The three to dominant types of material of the recent Meiji past, human feelings, social customs, and the sentimental idealizations of human character, were gradually replaced by three new types of material, actual everyday life, the everyday man, seikatsa, and his ego, shindi. The world of the work indeed grew dimmer and more cloistered the farther it moved away from the old ninjo bon love stories. It was as though the traditional Japanese novel, which had always been a species of materials-dependent literature, had somehow foreseen the coming furor that European naturalism would soon cause, presciently intuiting its influence even before its arrival. Then, just when naturalism began to arrive with its new notions and methods, the Japanese novel suddenly acquired a form formidable self-confidence that impelled writers to make the following tacit public pronouncement. We hereby declare that the everyday individual, se Seikatsha, who today both constitutes the main material of the work and more and more performs the role of the protagonist, shall henceforth always be identical to the author, and we vow never to fabricate or sensationalize when describing our own personal conduct and mental life. By the Taisho era, this newly forged brand of European naturalism was already beginning to exhibit hysterical symptoms as writers began to describe with increasing agitation and always in the first person the affairs and fits of their protagonists, delineating the locus of responsibility so that readers would immediately understand that this I and the author himself were categorically identical. 
with the ultimate effect that such frenzied works would soon come to constitute their own independent subset of literature. As a result of this shift, Japanese literature was presented with a golden opportunity to partake in the great literary upheaval that was still transpiring in the West, thanks in large to the, that singular invention that it had laboriously forged, namely the so-called Watakushi Shousetsu, or I novel. Since it is not my purpose here to trace the history of this new and unprecedented event called the Shousetsu, I shall limit myself to a brief description of the major twists and turns that occurred in the countless novels written between the late Edo period and today. As I just described, the history of the Japanese novel, or at least the popular conception of that history, developed through four phases. The Ninjobon romances of the Edo period, the so-called model, model literature of the Ken Yusha school, the pseudo-naturalist works, and finally, the so-called I novel. Watakushi Shousetsu. One would do well to approach each stage of the novel's evolution while bearing in mind that its main materials steadily increase in variety and scope, the technical skills of its authors grew more sophisticated with time, and it eventually came to exhibit an increasingly diverse range of lengths. But what then became of the Kant during this period? The Kant had first appeared as a form in Japan in 1915 with the publication of Moriogai's Tales from Various Countries, Shokoku Monogatai. There is no point in arguing that any Kant existed in Japan prior to this. Of Ogai's many remarkable achievements, it was his tales from various countries that had the profoundest effect on Japan's most prominent writers of the day. The magnitude of this work's influence can be gauged by the fact that not a single writer worthy of receiving its influence turned to writing Kant's full time. To be sure, many writers began dabbling in the form, yet none attempted to satisfy the whole of his novelistic exertion, his hankering to write a true shousetsu exclusively through the medium of the Kant. Perhaps this was because writers of the day unconsciously had their hearts set on crafting a shousetsu proper at some point. At, as for the little-known secret that it was Kant rather than the novel that spurred the Meiji Taisho writers in the direction of the Shousetsu. <clears throat> I will not go into the re any reasons here. Yet paradoxically, the centrality of the Kant's role yielded no fortunate results for the Kant. The majority of Kanteurs were hopelessly inept. They eventually either switched over to the novel, novelle, sank into the fusty pedantry of literature, or floundered miserably in their endeavors and gave up altogether. Those who managed to make it all the way to the authentic Shosetsu were a rare few indeed. In fact, the Kant appears to have dissolved almost immediately after it entered the post-Meiji literary scene, as its innumerable scatterings of stories were soon swept away in the overwhelming deluge of novels. As a result, the Kant petered out without ever forming a single autonomous school. There is no use wondering why this was the case, for the same thing had happened to its progenitor, the Sharebon chapbooks of the Edo period, when the Sharebon of Santo Kyoden and his cohorts was likewise pulled in the opposite direction and absorbed into the Ninjo Bon. While it is hard to single out a single out it's hard to single out a handful of representative novels since there are so many formidable tours de force. One is just as hard put to locate a single representative Kant, and this despite the fact that they had that they number in the thousands, include among them many charming works, and boast among their practitioners scores of celebrated authors. The reason for this is simple. There is not a single Kant that bears any real struggle or effort on the part of the author. As far as I can tell, there is only one great work among all the existing Kants, and yet this particular masterpiece has not even been ascribed the label of Kant, nor was it written by a member of the literary establishment. The work I'm referred to is none other than Yanaga Yanagita Kunio's One-Eyed Rascal. To call the ethnological research of this erudite gentleman a Kant will undoubtedly provoke the ire of many a critic, yet I cannot help but make the prediction that Yanagita's one-eyed rascal will, as a Kant, outlive any of those written by Octaga Ryunosuke, who is often regarded as our nation's greatest conteur. 
We have now reached the end of this third section, and yet I have nothing to offer by way of conclusion. My description has gone no further than a simple debriefing of the current situation of modern Japanese literature. I shall therefore sum up this modest report by offering a simple but practical definition of the term Tanpen Shosetsu. In general, what we are talking about when we talk about this Tanpen Shosetsu today is two things. A middle realm between the two separate domains of the Shosetsu proper and literature, Bungaka, first of all, and any work that floats and sinks within that intermediate, intermedi intermediary space. I would only add that Owing to the particular situation in Japan today, one who talks about the Tanpen Shosetsu or Tanpen is no doubt referring to what I have been calling the Nouvelle, a subset of literature, Bungaku, that ranges anywhere from 20 to 100 handwritten manuscript pages.